Hey, this is Scott Lowen of Candy Digital, the Web3 platform reimagining fandom. I'm here on the edge of NFT podcast. I'm a fan. You're a fan. Let's enjoy another great show today. Keep listening. Hi, NFT Curious listeners. Stay tuned for today's episode to learn how Candy Digital is leading the charge in sports and collectible NFTs to deepen fan connections and expand the rich legacy of collectibles. And why you should check out our socials to enter for a chance to win 1 million Eternity Stones, your ticket to the next amazing collector's experience. And uh, today's guest secret to cornering the childhood lemonade stand market through mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> All this and more on today's episode. And before we move on, don't forget that our Outer Edge LA event recently returned to Los Angeles in March of 2023. Think you missed out? Well, you can now catch up on all the discussions, presentations, and more by heading over to watch.outeredge.live and registering with just your email address. Then you'll have access to over 60 captivating conversations and performances. Binge watchers are welcome. Netflix, look out. We'll see you inside. Welcome to The Edge of NFT, the podcast that brings you the top 1% of Web3 today and what will stand the test of time. We explore the nuts and bolts of the business side and also the human element of how Web3 is changing the way we interact with the things we love. This podcast is for the dreamers, disruptors, and doers who are pumped about this ecosystem and driving where it goes next. Today's episode features Scott M. Lawin, the driving force behind Candy Digital, a di a leading platform specializing in sports and entertainment digital collectibles. Scott, apart from leading Candy Digital as the CEO and COO, has an impressive track record. He founded Parametric LP, a firm dedicated to early stage investments in advisory and blockchain fintech, art, and real estate. He has held significant roles in the industry, including the chief operating officer at Moore Capital Management, a $15 billion global alternative investment firm, and the same position at the Liquid Markets Business at Fortress Investment Group, following a fruitful 12-year stint at Goldman Sachs & Company. Candy Digital is reshaping the digital collectible landscape with unique NFTs that allow enthusiasts and collectors to buy, sell, and deepen their connection with sports culture and entertainment. Scott, welcome to Edge of NFT. Thank you so much. Great to be here. It's always a special moment to kind of hear what you've accomplished, you know. I'm sure when, you know, you get out of bed in the morning, you might not always, you know, be a little bit tired and be like, did I have I ever do anything? Yet? <laughs> Seems like there's a lot there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah. I, I know Josh had, had a question to launch things off. Josh, what, what, was, your, uh, what, was, your, what was your first one? Yeah, yeah. And um, just let me add, Scott, it's, it's been a long time coming, um, having you on the show. Obviously, it's great to have you part of the original Genesis version of NFTLA and, um, you know, been admiring your, your work in a space for, for quite some time. And I think, you know, when it comes to digital collectible potential, nothing sort of uh, hits home for me more than the world of sports and entertainment. Um, and I'd love to sort of kind of go back to the beginning to start things off and, and talk about the genesis of Candy Digital and and just like what 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 makes it unique? What what was sort of unique about your your um, approach to to digital collectibles going into this business? Yeah. So without going too far back, I'd say you know the the story of Candy's origin kind of started in probably 2012 and 2013, um, which is when I started you know paying attention, doing research, trying to get my head around what blockchain was. Uh, what it was going to become. I was still sort of, you know, deeply immersed in the financial services uh, world. And so really trying to understand what was this thing, Bitcoin, um, was it going to be a new digital currency? Was it a store of value? Was it going to be a new transaction processing layer, uh, a funding mechanism, a scam, all the above? Uh, and so that sort of started, you know, my my path of, um, you know, understanding more about the technology, thinking about its impact and, and ultimately where it was going. Fast forward to uh, 2020, kind of along that journey, I became, you know, more active as an investor. My business partner, Mike Novogratz, had started Galaxy Digital, 
you know, really building kind of the leading uh, merchant bank in the in the blockchain and crypto space. And sort of mid pandemic, we were sitting down and and really kind of marking to market where where was uh, crypto from an adoption perspective with institutions. Um, we knew that um, you know big pools of capital were starting to invest in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, a lot of you know major global players were starting to build the infrastructure. Um, there was kind of a regulatory framework discussions that were starting to be afoot. And, and we said, you know, how do how does this technology go from just being in a sort of investable asset into something that you know has broad appeal to a mass market audience and focused on content, right? And so understanding sort of the power of what it means to uh, have an authenticated ownership of a of a digital asset, um, the power that creators can have then in the ongoing royalty stream, and ultimately the role. Uh, that digital identity will play in the future. And so, you know, we spent time thinking about art, thinking about music, thinking about sports, culture, et cetera, and really zeroed in on sports. Um, my co-founder is, is Mike's brother, Matt Novogratz. Um, Matt had been at Galaxy um, building out a sports business there. And, you know, we looked at the role that uh, physical collectibles played in people's identity, in community, um, and as uh, as sort of a, a broader collectible market store of value, and said, you know, we see a future where physical, fractional physical, and ultimately digital collectibles, um, there's a natural progression there. And so, if we can think about the sports industry with you know billions of global fans, super passionate communities and a collectibles business that people are already engaged in and understand, we think that's a great path to kind of onboard the next 1 million, 10 million, 100 million people into the space. And so that was that was really kind of the, you know, the genesis of, of how mm -hmm. Candy got started um, was, was really looking at, you know, what we thought, frankly, was going to be a longer progression into kind of a digital only world sitting in 2020 when you know, I like to say, unless you were in the in the crypto space, very few people knew how to spell NFT, right? It wasn't wasn't something that had sort of captured the zeitgeist yet, right? Um, for 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 most folks, 2021 obviously changed that, and um, you know, we we really pivoted towards developing our digital first strategy, and then certainly with our first partner, Major League Baseball, um, you know, that that was really the the fire that started Candy's growth. I'm also trying to spell zeitgeist. Uh, we'll see if I can get that. <laughs> uh, next question here. Uh, you know, the Major League Baseball has been a big part of, of what's going on with what you're doing. Um, how, how are NFTs in your mind transforming what's going on with baseball fans and their experience? So um, we've always approached the space, I think, from the perspective of we think NFTs aren't just you know, the next gen version of the physical trading card. Um, we certainly see it as an evolution, but we, we think of NFTs and the role that digital assets will play in any kind of content relationship, but let's, call, let's talk about baseball in particular, as something that can enhance and extend that experience of being a fan. And so, you know, we've developed at Candy a series of kind of core products uh, with our partners at Major League Baseball. The first is very much a digital trading card. We call it our, our icon card, which is trading card 3.0, um, a digital ticket, uh, a commemorative asset that really starts to tie people's experience back to being at a, at a live event, watching the game or, 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 or watching it on TV. And then uh, a video uh, component that captures those very special moments, right? Um, and then thinking about those not necessarily as distinct separate products, but really starting to think about how do these digital assets um, start to build that loyalty, engagement, and kind of fan uh, value, both for themselves as a collector, for the community, and then ultimately for that relationship with people's favorite team or, or player. Um, and so we're still at the early days of that, right? Um, we started out with the, you know, our digital icon collectibles. They have a lot of the same types of uh, scarcity and rarity features that traditional uh, physical trading cards do. They come in blind packs, um, but they are much more dynamic assets, right? They incorporate static imagery, video, audio, motion graphics, signatures, and they change over time, right? We use the power of smart contracts in the blockchain to pump real-time data into them. 
every time those players play a game, those stats update over time. So they have their own characteristics as, as collectibles. They also become items that our collectors can use in challenges um, and to solve puzzles. And so there's an engagement component of being able to not just complete a set and unlock something that you know is unique, but also to use those in an online trivia game that changes over time, builds people's sort of loyalty scores and engagement scores. And ultimately, um, the things that we're working on with baseball and exploring now is taking those assets out of your off your computer screen and, and out of your phone and digital wallet and giving them value or in the stadium. And so you can you can see a world as you know our fans and collectors and, and new people come into the space that not only have you collected um, a handful of you know your favorite digital icon uh, icon players, but you've been to a number of games, you've redeemed digital tickets, and let's say you're a Mets fan, the Mets now know, right, that uh, you know Josh is a huge Mets fan, and before he goes to the game, you know his NFT, you know his NFT of Pete Alonso catches on fire and he has an opportunity to go early to batting practice and, you know, maybe meet Pete ahead of the game. Or, you know, Ethan, you're sitting out in uh, right field and, you know, your favorite player hits a home run there and suddenly you're airdropped a video moment of that home run, right, that commemorates your experience at the game. And so that's, you know, those are the things that we're sort of working on building and where we really see the future of fan engagement going, where digital assets, you know, aren't just things in and above themselves, but they really relate to what that fan experience is. Yeah, that's that's fun. And it's just making me think of, um, we've, we've got a really fun sponsor right now called Swoops. Uh, so we have a digital basketball team um, and we get digital basketball players and we get to play against other teams and you know the players are NFTs, right? But I can imagine the yep. next level of what they're doing uh, is why not have actual trading cards where there's multiple instances for those particular players. So we can own the player, but then other people could trade the card and kind of have fun with that experience. Maybe there's a partnership in order. I don't know. Um, but yeah, there's just so there's so much potential here, and I feel like it opens opens up the possibility of collectibles, maybe to a new domain of fans, right? So, yeah. so some people might have been physical card I don't get it but then once you can engage and interact they're having a lot more fun yeah I was kind of browsing a little bit Scott the the internet for stats and you know came up with this um stat that it looks like definitely there's an increase in 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 fandom from 35 to 44 than there is from 18 to 34 and I imagine that you know MLB looked at what you're doing as an opportunity to sort of um tighten that relationship with younger fans that are really into gamification um you know along that lines you guys crushed it with with your your token sales and and a pretty astonishing achievement there to what extent was that tapping into the zeitgeist of the younger fan versus the the more traditional fan you know, it's pretty interesting because I'd, I'd say, you know, most people would expect that our fan base skews younger, just given interest in blockchain and, you know, sort of, you know, di digital anything. Um, the reality is, is it's really pretty balanced. Um, you know, we have 18 year old collectors and we have 65 year old collectors. Um, you know, the, the core of our collector base is in that sort of like late 20s to, you know, mid 30s. But some of our largest collectors um, have been collecting for years and, you know, they've been collector. They're huge baseball fans. They've collected cardboard. They've collected mem mem memorabilia. And I think, you know, one of the comments that, that one of those collectors made to me that's always stuck with me is he was a specific collector of cigarette cards. So the Honus Wagners, if you're familiar, you know, the, the sort of the, the very first baseball cards, which were giveaways and cigarette packets. And he said, you know, if I had a time machine, I would snap my fingers and I would go back and I would buy every one of those that I possibly could. If I, you know, if I knew what I knew now about, you know, physical card collectors, collectibles. And he's like, that's why I'm in this space. He's like, I know that digital collectibles are going to become hugely important over time. And so, you know, I want to be in on the ground floor and I want to kind of help, you know, be part of that movement and build this next phase of what collectibles and fan engagement is about. I love that. And, 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 and just getting into the details there, like how exactly did you, did you pull off such a big sale, like two over 2 million token sales? Is that correct? 
Yeah, we've sold about two, just just under one point, or just over 1.9 million NFTs at this point. Um, and that's not just with um, Major League Baseball, right? That's also uh, with our other partners at NASCAR, at WWE, um, Netflix, Getty Images, college athletes. And so, you know, our approach to the space was um, that content, sports content, entertainment content, media content, all has a different approach, all have sort of, you know, passionate fan bases, but they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. And so, you know, I can be a fan of uh, Stranger Things and also be a huge Yankees fan, right? I can uh, watch NASCAR races on the weekend and still collect photography. And so finding, you know, creating uh, ecosystems for our partners and creating the right product structures that resonate with their core communities is important, but also there's some really interesting synergies across those different um, partnerships as well. So yeah, when you add yeah, it all should, up, you know, just about 2 million. Yeah, I should clarify, obviously we're talking about non-fungible tokens, NFT is not your traditional like tokens um, that, that sometimes Correct. people associate. A uh, very special type of token that, that we love dearly on this show. Absolutely. I love that story about the uh, cigarette packs, by the way. And of course, when you say that, know what I know now versus know what I know then, it's kind of interesting to think you would throw away the actual product, <laughs> the actual cigarettes, but keep the collectible. Uh, it, it's, it says a lot about collectibles, you know, um, and their value over time. You know? yeah. yeah, I mean, I think, I think at the core of what, you know, how we think about our products and how we work with our partners is that, as I said before, this is ultimately about digital identity, right? It's about the things that you own that tell your story, that connect you to stories, that connect you to communities that have shared values and shared interests. And that's, I think, what get us, gets us really excited, not just about, you know, what we've done, but, you know, where the future is going and the role that NFTs are going to play in that. Sure. Um, you know, any more words on how uh, the NFTs are allowing people to strengthen the kind of connections and bonds they're looking for uh, with players and, you know, the sports that they love? Yeah. So, you know, we try uh, every day to kind of think about how we bring more of that value to our collectors um, to, you know, we've got two recent examples. Um we just had a group of collectors down in Atlanta to meet with the player Mike Harris. Um, you know, and those those collectors are, you know, not just uh, you know not just fans of of, of Mike and the team, but um, you know they've collected across uh, you know all, all of the different products and teams, and so that was an IRL experience that they wouldn't have otherwise had if they were you know just going to baseball games or you know buying cardboard cards. Um, well, just last Friday, we had a meet and greet with Pete Alonzo from the Mets. Um, Pete is one of, you know, Pete was an early player who discovered candy and started, you know, buying our products and trading our products. And he's a candy ambassador. And again, same type of thing, you know, kind of a small group of, uh, of our fans and collectors who got to have the, that one-on-one -on -one experience with Pete. And so, you know, we want to do more of those things. Um, baseball has been a great partner. They're, you know, they're excited about the future of Web3 and um, the Players Association helps with that or association with the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, and so, you know, those, we'd love to do those things every day. Uh, they're harder to organize than you think, uh, right? And, and so, um, you know, we try to balance that out over the course of a season and really think about, okay, what, what can, how can we cross that digital, physical and digital experiential divide in a meaningful way? Yeah, no, that's great. While you're at it, Scott, I know you have a lot of free time. Can you do something about getting the Red Sox into a less competitive division? This AL East is killing me. <laughs> like what's going on here where like the records of our teams are all better than every other division practically. It doesn't make any sense. Like the Red Sox would be almost tied for first place if they were in the central. I know. I, I don't. I don't think I can help you on that one. Uh, I'll say we've we've got more Yankees fans at Candy than Red Sox fans, but we but but we got a decent number of those as well. So. Uh, you just yeah. take the city of Boston, move it to the Midwest or something, maybe. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> whatever we got to do. It's, it's killing me. It's really it's crushing yeah. my soul. Less lobster. But, um, base. You know, it, it, more, there's more still a lot of still a lot of the season left. We'll see. Yeah. True. True. Anything can still happen. Um, it's been a wild few years in sports. 
But, you know, I, I, I think you, you, you touched on sort of your deep uh, relationship with, with the MLB. And, and there's another element of your sort of um, maturation in the space, which is your partnership with Fanatics. And I know that relationship has evolved. Um, you know, I, I'd love to sort of at least touch on the initial impetus for that partnership and how your perspective is rooted in a different hypothesis at this point than the Fanatics crew. Yeah, so, you know, Fanatics was one of our first partners when we got started. Um, you know, so the, as I was saying, when we were thinking about this opportunity and deciding to focus on sports, and we said, hey, who do we want to build a business with in, in the sports space? Um, Fanatics is at the top of the list. And so um, when Candy got started, it really got started uh, with Galaxy and, and Fanatics being early investors. Um, you know, as we saw sort of the, you know, the run up in 2021, and then you know, the market start to readjust in 2022. Um, you know, I think our view over time that, you know, the, the opportunity here certainly was uh, in the early days about digital collectibles, but really about sort of Web3 fan engagement and all the things that we think Web3 digital ownership decentralization can kind of bring to the table. Um, you know, in a, in a down market, I think Fanatics' perspective, um, you know, was maybe rooted a little bit more in their physical first business. And, and thinking about, you know, the, the physical collectible and, and, you know, how digital might pair with that. And so at the end of last year, um, you know, we, while well, we realize we're in a, in, a, in a challenging market and will likely be challenging for a while, um, you know, we actually see a great opportunity for consolidation in the industry and we want to be a catalyst for that. Um, and so we just decided to kind of uh, go our separate ways um, from that perspective. And so Fanatics, continues to be an investor in the business, but less less significant than they were before. Yeah, that makes sense. And I got to imagine in a down market, um, even the physical merchandise business is impacted, right? I, I, you know, I don't, I don't know the numbers, but I think, you know, the, the, the macro environment is somewhat inescapable if you are, if you're selling products, whether they're physical products or digital products. Yeah, so so I think you know doubling down on what you're you're good at and what you know makes sense. But obviously, um, you know we're we're bullish on the long term potential of of this industry and digital collectibles. And I think what you guys have done with MLB is a is a really uh, great case study. So um, appreciate you sharing that insight with us. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And it's great to be able to hear some details there. I mean. I believe this was one of our hot topic stories at one point talking about candy digital and fanatics, you know, and, and, uh, and I'm walking through it. Um, so it's great to have a firsthand perspective. Um, so web three is really burgeoning here though, even though we talked about down markets and, you know, withdrawals and things like that, uh, there's a lot of sectors, especially, you know, you see very interesting players right now in a time where some people are withdrawing, you know, still doing a lot. Um, so where do you think this is all headed? You know, uh, where, what is the future role of, you know, let's at least talk about the sports industry of Web3, you know, NFTs, digital ownership, stuff like that. So I think, you know, the two perspectives, right? The, the macro picture, I think, is that, you know, our key thesis is that a digital asset is really going to be at the center of most brand and fan engagements in the future. And whether it's called an NFT, whether it's called digital collectible, whether it's called a reward point or a game piece or, or whatever it is, just the idea of you know, that ownership of that token or content and the idea that a content owner and a brand or a creator can start to have a much more dynamic one-to-one -one relationship with a customer and a fan, we really believe that's the big idea. And so, you know, starting in digital collectibles, because people have familiarity with collectibles, they, you know, they can sort of make the leap from the physical to the digital. They understand the enhancements, the dynamism makes a lot of sense. But I think as we go forward, um, we're going to spend less time, you know, maybe talking about uh, the specifics of, you know, NFTs and drops, and we're going to spend more time talking about these connected communities that are bound by ownership, right? Whether that ultimately means that, you know, DAO structures will start to play a more important role, um, whether it means that, uh, you know, marketing, uh, marketing activations and budgets drive more of these sort of fan engagements. I think those are all things we're figuring out, right, as a business and as an industry. I think specifically in sports, um, what, what we'll see is that 
all of those different touch points that we talked about, whether it's buying a product, whether it's going to a game, whether it's watching something on TV, whether it's participating in a fan poll, all of those are opportunities, right, for a digital record of that engagement. And, you know, whether that's ownership of an NFT, whether it's a PO app, whether it ends up, whether it means you're part of a smaller, you know, DAO or community that gets to have some voting uh, on different decisions. That's, I think, where things are going to continue to go. The pace with which they go will have something to do with the commercial opportunity that, you know, uh, is, is available in the market. And, you know, if we look back at what just happened over the last two years, there's so many great things that happened in terms of introducing NFTs and digital assets to, you know, folks who, who weren't educated or, uh, or interested but there was also a lot of bad stuff that happened, right? Um, the market got ahead of itself. Prices pumped way too high. A lot of people sort of came in thinking that this was a new get rich quick scheme. Um, and there was a lot of wreckage on the back end of that. Big properties, entertainment properties and sports properties are ultimately brands, right? They, they, had, they, they, wanna, they want the right brand experience for their customers. They wanna, build, they wanna continue to build that loyalty and that trust. And so, you know, it's it's going to take a little bit of time for us as an industry to kind of come together to continue to sort of build that trust, that uh, that infrastructure for the next round of fans and customers to kind of come in at scale. I love that. And, you know, you pushed out a lot of potential uh, opportunities for other brands outside of, of MLB. So it sort of begs the question, what does your roadmap look like going forward? And, and are there any sort of partnerships, um, collaborations, you know, new features um, that, that you're sort of excited about and can speak to at this point? So, you know, we're the interesting thing is, you know, despite the market being uh, very different than it was a year ago, we actually have more incoming interest in, you know, partnerships and, and opportunities than we did even a year ago, right? And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I think one, um, you know, you had lots of capital and lots of companies sort of created from thin air. Um, and on the back end of a, of a more challenging market, a lot of those players, you know, will shift, will pivot their direction or, or sort of shift their focus or may not be around. And so I think there's a smaller number, number of kind of credible long-term partners and content owners and brands uh, want to do business with. Um, we're very selective about, uh, you know, who, who we bring on as a partner and how we think about it. One, because, you know, since we, you know, we, we know this is a business that, actually takes a lot to do well um, and to do well at scale. We want to make sure that you know, we aren't distracted um, from our existing partners where we think there's lots of opportunity to continue to bring new people into the space and deliver value to our customers and our partners. And two, we want to make sure that it, you know, it's something that we think is scalable and repeatable. And so um, we, you know, we never ended up doing any of the kind of one and done releases because we wanted to make sure that, you know, there was a story there for our customers and for our community that was bigger than just, you know, kind of a, a one-off drop and then sort of moving on to the next thing. So I would say um, that's a long way of saying, um, absolutely expect to, to bring some new partners on, um, certainly in, in the short term in the entertainment space. Um, and then, you know, we're having some conversations with some other partners in the sports space that could be very significant long-term relationships. Awesome stuff. Exciting stuff. All right. Let us uh, wrap that segment up. Very informative. Lots of great stuff. Lots of history and details and foreshadowing to, to, to interesting new developments. Um, but let's get on to quick hitters. And this is a, a quick and fun way to get to know you a little bit better. 10 questions. We're looking for just a short, single or few word response. But feel free to expand if you get the urge. Are you ready, Scott? Let's do it. He's ready. All right. First question. What is the first thing you remember ever purchasing in your life? Uh, record album uh, by Queen. Ooh, classic. I'm old. Classic. Do you, have <laughs> a, do you have a favorite Queen track? Uh, you know, it's hard is to Is it appropriate to say Rhapsody. Fat Bottom Girls, right? 
that you know, that that one comes to mind, but it, but uh, but I think it's uh, I think it's Bohemian Rhapsody. Bohemian Rhapsody it's played a to. significant role in so many different uh, points of my life. Yeah, I remember first hearing that song and trying to play it on the piano and singing along. Yeah, it's it's what a classic, man! It it, it was so wonderful to. I mean, I, I got that from my brothers, those sort of classic rock developments, and they passed it along to me. But just that concept of rock crossing over into opera, you know, it just amazing, you know, completely yeah. well done. So creative, so imaginative. It was a radical song at the time, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, question number two. What's the first thing you remember ever selling in your life? Uh, I started selling lemonade, uh, when I was, uh, uh, I think in third grade, um, I cornered the market in my, uh, in my neighborhood. Um, so that was my, uh, that was my beginning of uh, my the market. journey. Did you have <laughs> like, uh, there, did you really, is there details on that? That's I, I mean, I feel well, like you there... had a prime location on the street. Like, like you, you were he right. bought up that... all the lemons from the store. He was at no, that crossing I... walk where everyone had to go through. <laughs> no, what I, what I did was I, I was selling lemonade and there were other kids selling lemonade. And uh, one of the other kids actually had a better location. And so I went over there and I said, like, we should just sell lemonade together. And then we recruited I was thinking. other kids selling lemonade. Yeah. So we, we just, we consolidated mergers and acquisitions, we more money together than, uh, you know, separately. I, I, Plus I the, love... that kid had, actually had better lemonade than I made. So, yeah. Oh man. I love that early, early M&A roots. Um, <laughs> very, very, that, that, that's great. Um, all right. So next question, what is the most recent thing you purchased? I just wanted to say, was there any price fixing then involved? I mean, no, nah, just just kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no price fixing. Uh, we we haggled hard for tips though. Uh, um, the most recent thing I purchased uh, was a series of uh, prints from uh, the Borlek brothers from the Wrong Shop over in the UK. I'm uh, aside from NFTs, I'm a big uh, sort of. Uh, art collector and so uh yeah that that's what i literally 24 hours ago nice um cool. yeah i think art art just continues to to go up in value historically it's it's one of the you know strongest appreciating assets we have right now so um not yeah i can't i i think of more just like i i'm a uh, an addict for sort of things that are visually dynamic and my my kind of built environment so uh i love to I love to rotate my art when I can. I'm going to have to check out these guys. I, I wasn't familiar. So it sounds like something I'll look into. What is the most recent thing you sold? Uh, most recent thing I sold. I don't know. If you ask my wife, she says I never get rid of anything. I just accumulate more things. Uh, <laughs> I think the, uh, I think the last thing I probably sold was, uh, uh, was a car. Uh, but that was like uh, pre-pandemic, so a while ago. Yeah, my my girlfriend has the same critique, but you know, I, it looks like you're pretty minimalistic from your office background there. So maybe she's being a little hard on you. Yeah, that was my follow-up question. <laughs> Is it well organized? At least you know the stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's good. Exactly. Well, listen. The parts, part of working at Candy is you have to be a collector at heart, uh, and so that's everything from you know trading cards to comic books to art figures to you know whatever uh we all have that kind of in our dna yep all right question number five what's your most prized possession of all those things you got floating around most prized possession uh is a uh, a sculpture by the artist cause uh if you're familiar with him uh he's a uh, street artist uh who has kind of become uh, in, in many ways, sort of an Andy Warhol-esque figure uh, of uh, creating multiples and taking his visual art and turning it into physical art. He's done a, his kind of first NFT project not too long ago. Um, but uh, I've got a great wooden sculpture, which is one of a very small number. And so that's my probably my most prized collection, prized piece in my collection. Yeah. Awesome. Very appropriate. All right. Next question is, if you could buy anything in the world, digital, physical service or experience that is currently for sale, what would that be? 
This is uh, this is personally, or this is from a business perspective. You, I think you could choose how to answer it. You know, however you like. Um, you could do both if you want. If you and we, if we have time for that. Yeah, I think uh, right now, uh, I think I would I'd be available for sale in the world. I think I would probably um, want the uh, the private keys to. Uh, you know, a, a, a very, a very significant digital wallet, but I don't know if those are, nice. are necessarily for sale. That's an interesting, well, that's an interesting thing, right? Instead of just actually having a token or a bunch of tokens or whatever, a wallet, right? And then you get to kind of like, look and see, oh, what are the cool things I got in there? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, listen, I, you know, obviously, you, you know, following various wallets and uh, seeing how those collections change and, you know, kind of who the, tastemakers in the space are and where trends are going, I think is, um, you know, part of the beauty of blockchain, but being an owner of those assets is, uh, is also significant. Yeah, for sure. And Scott, if you could pass on one of your personality traits to the next generation, what would it be? Curiosity. Um, it's what I uh, tell my kids all the time. Um, you know, the world is a fascinating place that is constantly changing. And regardless of what you want to do, just keep asking questions, learn more, uh, get interested in the things that you're not doing, understand why other people are interested in them. I think that just makes not just as a path for success, but it makes for a much more rich and interesting life. Very yeah, cool. certainly in dynamic times like today with with AI and, and everything shifting the world, if you if you stay curious, there's always going to be an interesting path forward for yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, and, I heard an interesting an, uh, interview with Elon Musk, and he was saying it's not like what the answer, what are the answers, you know, it's it's what are the questions, right? What are the right questions? Absolutely. Yeah. So on the flip side, Scott, if you could eliminate one of your personality traits from the next generation, what would it be? Um, I would say uh, procrastination. Uh, I, I've, uh, you know, I've made it, I, I've done okay so far, um, you know, uh, fighting the, the urge to procrastinate, but I, uh, I like to do a lot of things at, at once. And I find that, uh, you know, getting them all done uh, sometimes takes a lot longer uh, than it should. Does that does that mean that you, like me, have a lot of tabs open in your browser at all times? Oh, yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. All right. So, um, you know, it's not a it's not a isolated problem. Uh, it's something that other entrepreneurs <laughs> experience as well. Got it. Well, listen, yeah, I, bl it, I blame it on my curiosity, right? I say that, you know, there's lots of things I'm interested in, but then I'll get to them later. So, <laughs> you know, I, I think that's sort of, um, it's probably a common set of traits in, in the Web3 community. I think all of us, um, we're pretty curious folks. And, um, you know, we get excited by all the innovation happening around us. And we, we want our, to take part in all of it. But alas, there's only so many hours of the day. And, and at some point, everyone does have to sleep. Yes. Absolutely. Although one of our Sadly. previous guests did want to purchase the ability not to sleep or something like that. That was it. <laughs> All right. So oh, I didn't know that was a choice. I thought you said it was available. Yeah, yeah. For I sale. don't know if it is available for sale, but they asked for it. <laughs> All right. So last two questions are kind of simple ones. And then there might be a bonus or two. Um, what, okay. number, question number nine, what did you do just before joining us on the podcast? Uh, I was in the middle of negotiating a, a fairly significant strategic deal. All right, making deals. Uh, question number 10, what are you going to do next after the podcast? I'm about to jump into my executive committee meeting. So, um, you know, not, not, not to say that I'm back, you know, I, I got you guys sandwiched between two, you know, serious business meetings, but that just turns out how it happened to, be, to work out. Well, hopefully this is letting loose a little bit of stress here. All right. I've got, exactly. I've got two bonus questions. We'll just hit them quickly. I think that'd be fun. Uh, next, the first bonus question, have you gotten any insane perks from working with all these iconic brands and personalities? Is there some special moment or do you just, is it just board meetings and negotiations and other people get to hang out with uh, sports celebrities? <laughs> you know, listen, I, I, there, there, there's lots of great perks of working with sports and entertainment companies, right? If, you know, it, it, if you're a fan, you know, getting go to the world series or the super bowl or, you know, the all-star game, 
um, you know, meeting some of the actors or the curators of, you know, a, a Netflix show or Getty image collection. Um, those things are all fantastic. Right. Nice. Um, we try to, we try to spread the wealth, uh, you know, uh, within the company as well. And so, you know, we've got people who are kind of front and center in those relationships, but, um, you know, those are, those are great parts of being in the business. All right. Last, last bonus question. I think this will be funny. What's your go-to procrastination activity? <laughs> Wordle. Wordle. Uh, Wordle, and, okay. Wordle and crosswords. Yeah, exactly. Well, Wordle's a good one because it usually doesn't take that long to get that, you know. It's pretty you quick, lose. but, you know, you can, go, you can go deep in crosswords. <laughs> that, yeah, that could take a while. All right, awesome. Thanks for participating. Uh, let's move on to the next segment. All right. And I feel like right now uh, we're about to wrap up, but before we do, let's make sure um, we do a little bit of a shout out. I understand you had maybe someone you'd like to shout out uh, before we wrap. Yeah. Um, so I'll give a shout out to the team at uh, Paul Nepti Studios. You know, I mentioned, uh, you know, this is an interesting time in the business and, you know, we're spending a lot of time talking to other folks that we respect and uh, you know, think they kind of have the right program and the right approach to uh, to the space, and um, have a lot of respect for that team. So, give them a big shout out. Very nice, perfect. Yeah, we had them on the podcast. Um, all right. Finally, we're going to start wrapping up, and of course, the quintessential, you know, penultimate question is: Where can listeners go to find out more about you and what you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so go to www.candy.com um, to see everything that you know Candy has to offer uh, from our uh, all of our various partners, our collections, our challenges, our engagement, um, and then uh, follow us on uh, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Indeed. Great. Hi. And and I guess Ethan, we do have a, a giveaway from Candy Digital that we'll be uh, putting out on socials. Scott, do you have any more insights on the details there that you can share with us? Yeah, absolutely. So we are uh, giving away uh, packs of our This Month in Baseball product. Uh, this, these are blind pack uh, collectibles of, of some of the most important uh, and exciting moments in the history of baseball. Um, so as I mentioned before, we're partners with Major League Baseball, but we're also partners with the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, and uh, really exciting, you know, for collectors today who are excited about the future and the current state, but uh, look back to the past and, you know, have an opportunity to participate and own some of those special moments too. Well, thanks uh, for that generosity. And um, I'm sure our listeners will appreciate it. Yep, absolutely. Awesome. Okay. We've reached the outer limit at the edge of NFTs for today. Thanks for exploring with us. We've got space for more adventures on the Starship. So invite your friends and recruit some cool strangers that will make this journey all so much better. How? Go to Spotify or iTunes right now. Rate us and say something awesome. Then go to edgeofnft.com to dive further down the rabbit hole. Look us up on all major social platforms by typing edge of NFT with no spaces and start a fun conversation with us online. Lastly, be sure to tune in next time for more great NFT content. Thanks again for sharing this time with us today. The views and opinions expressed on Edge of NFT reflect solely those views and opinions of the show hosts and its guests. Please make sure to do your own research. Our show is not financial advice. You understand that you are using any and all information available on or through this podcast at your own risk. Whenever making financial decisions, we recommend doing your own research and talking to your accountant for financial advice. From time to time, we may feature sponsored content on the show for which we receive value, and we may share links for which we receive a commission if you make a purchase through one of those links. Refer to our website, www.edgeofnft.com, for our full disclaimer, terms and conditions, and privacy policy.